Good morning and welcome to the Emerson Climate Technologies and Retail Solutions E360 webinar. Uh, my name is Dean Landesh and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, we'll be walking through a presentation on what is the future of regulation in energy, food safety, and refrigerants. Uh, we will be taking questions later from the audience and we'll give you more instructions on that. And uh, we have a live audience here in our Helix Innovation Center in, at the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio. It's a beautiful new facility that Emerson has opened to facilitate collaboration, ideation, and innovation with a wide variety of partners in our industry, our customers, and the academic community and beyond. Uh, we're in our second day here of the E360 conference with about, a, about 200 people on site, and we say welcome to all of the, the more than 400 of you who are joining us by webinar today. For those of you who are not familiar with Emerson Retail Solutions, we provide uh, controls, connectivity, monitoring services, and insights for the retail, grocery business, convenience stores, restaurants, and the transport industry. Uh, we're part of the broader Emerson Climate Technologies and Emerson, which is a global company as well. You can always find information on us at emersonclimate.com forward slash retail solutions. A few words about the presentation today. Uh, as always, regulation and the enforcement of regulation is an ever-changing topic. So while our team and the team of speakers has done their best uh, to provide accurate and timely information, we always encourage you to check with your own advisors before you make any decisions regarding future actions that you may take regarding regulation. Uh, great to get that advice, and uh, we highly recommend that you seek such advice before you take any action on regulation. It's my pleasure today to introduce our three speakers. Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Rajan Rajendran. He's Vice President of System Innovation, uh, our System Innovation Center and Sustainability here for Emerson Climate Technologies. Uh, and he also runs here the, Inno the Innovation Center at the University of Dayton. Our second speaker will be Michael Britt. He is Vice President at the Energy and Innovation Center at, of Southern Companies. That's located at the Technology Center at the University uh, at Georgia Tech. And uh, we also operate a second Helix Innovation Center at Georgia Tech. Uh, it's tied in with this one. Uh, we're working there with the engineering teams, working on future ideation, innovation, and collaboration. Uh, that center at Georgia Tech is an, is an incubator, business incubator center as well, where lots of small startup companies go uh, to uh, get their start and to interact with a large variety of established companies as well as future innovators. Uh, you'll be hearing more about the Helix at Georgia Tech uh, in future months as we get to a formal opening. And our third speaker is Mark Sanchez. Um, he is an FDA and USDA regulatory attorney. Uh, he's a well-known uh, author. He's frequently sought out by leading media to comment on food safety and FDA matters. Um, both Michael and Mark will be joining us remotely. Um, as I mentioned, Michael from Georgia Tech and Mark Sanchez from his offices near Washington, DC. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Rajan Rajendran. Thank you, Dean. Um, I'm not a person that speaks with notes, but since uh, we only have about 10 to 15 minutes, I want to make sure that I um, cover the points uh, that need to be covered. Um, I'm going to take care of about six items. If there's, uh, you know, if there's nothing else, I want you to take away six points from here. The first one is about uh, international regulation that is uh, happening right now in the refrigerant world. The second one is about uh, some of the US EPA actions that have been going on here uh, in, in the United States. The third one is I want to touch upon what's going on in Canada. Fourth, I don't have a slide on this, but I will talk to a little bit about the Section 608 and the proposals. I know you heard a lot about that today. Those of you that are here on site, you heard a lot about Section 608, so I'll just mention it very briefly. And then the fifth topic is where I'm going to touch upon some refrigerant alternatives. The landscape is still evolving, but it's, you've all seen that blue chart before, so I'm going to bring that up again and just talk very briefly to that. And the last point I want to make is about transport refrigeration. So that's going to be my objective to cover these six points. So with that, uh, let me jump straight into this uh, first chart 
which is uh, an international uh, regulation. This is uh, actually Montreal Protocol. You're all familiar with Montreal Protocol that uh, curbed uh, the use of 22, took it away. Before that, it took away R12. And the reason for that was ozone depletion. As a consequence of the Montreal Protocol, all the HFCs came into being. And uh, now uh, there is uh, tremendous interest in trying to curtail the use of HFCs for global warming reasons. So that is why this proposal, uh, instead, of having, um, instead of having a whole quilt work of uh, regulations and actions all over the world, uh, Canada, United States, and Mexico came together. And about six years ago, they made this proposal called the North American Proposal. Uh, it did not go anywhere for a long time. But uh, in, in recent months, it has actually made some significant progress. The most important thing to note about this proposal is that um, they're talking about a baseline, which is what you see on top, where it says 100%. And then taking the HFC production or consumption all the way down to about 20%. The end year is not yet determined whether it is 2030 or 2050 is still uh, to be negotiated, and the steps are also to be negotiated. That is a North American proposal, and there are other proposals on the table, India, Micronesia, African nations, etc. And this last December, all the countries finally got together in Dubai, and they came up with this agreement where they all agreed that Yes, we do need to do something about these HFCs, and yes, we like the idea of a phase down, and yes, we will. Uh, by the way, the phase down, it's a phase down, it's not a phase out. Um, and uh, they did agree that they will try to work on some of the details, and so the countries are doing that. There are three meetings. One has already happened. The second one is in July, and the third one is in October. But those are the official meetings. In between all those meetings, lots of other meetings are going on. And this is something that I would track. If I were you, I would track this just to see where it is that all the countries in the world, and therefore us, will head in terms of uh, HFCs. Let me talk about the US EPA action. This is July, um, in July, on July 20th, 2015. Apologize for the uh, white on green. It doesn't show up very well. But the first column is a refrigerant. The second column is for supermarket new. And the fourth column is for remote condensing units. And then the last uh, four columns are for standalone self-contained units. Many of you here in this audience are already familiar with a lot of these delisting. This is a delisting where they're actually not allowing certain refrigerants in certain applications beyond a certain date. That's what you see there. For example, 404A is not allowed in supermarket, new supermarkets as of January 1, 2017. That's the second row and second column that I'm reading. And then you can see the rest of it. This is actually a final rule. That means there's no more negotiation on this. Okay? And so if you, if you have an affected product in this, or if you're an end user who uses these products, and all of you here do, then you should be looking at this and making sure that your OEMs and the component suppliers are actually su providing you all the answers that you need. Okay? Now, um, the EPA has also come out with a another proposal now in March. And uh, there's about two charts on this. And this proposal is a little bit broad. They did talk about some acceptable alternatives. They talked about some proposed unacceptable alternatives. Those are the two things that you see over there. And the important thing here that I want to point out is they are talking about commercialized machines, allowing propane in commercialized machine. And then you can see some of the auto vehicles and things like that. And the last uh, point here, the last row, residential light commercial AC. There have been a lot of people that have been uh, putting in flammable refrigerants as retrofits in residential HVAC systems. That has happened uh, a few times here in this country, and so the EPA clearly is coming out and saying those are not allowed. And that is what they, this is, by the way, it's a proposal. It's not a final rule yet. Now, from a refrigeration point of view, uh, there are a few uh, that are affected. That's in the second row, cold storage, warehouses, and retail food refrigeration. This is what you would call uh, like the frozen uh, carbonated beverage and such, everything that is dispensed through a nozzle, like ice cream machines and so on. And then, of course, household refrigerators. But if you are in the business of uh, building or buying centrifugal chillers or any positive displacement chiller, whether it is uh, scroll or recip or whatever, 
uh, they are talking about taking out 407C and 410A in these chillers as of uh, 2024. Again, this is a proposal. The final rule is not out yet. In Canada, um, by the way, I'm not talking about California because I know that California has also got something. And if you have any questions about that, ask me during the Q&A and I'll try to answer that. Canada has got a proposal out and uh, this is not a final rule. They think it's going to be filed sometime by the end of uh, this calendar year or early next year. Um, they are limiting Canada limits uh, in each application by GWP number. They don't go by a refrigerant. They just go by a GWP number. So they are talking about refrigeration. You can read it as well as I can. 650, 1500, central systems, 1500, and all, all the way down, AC chillers. So they're talking about 700 GWP, domestic refrigeration and mobile refrigeration. This is the only place where you'll see uh, Canada, as far as I know, is the only place where I've seen a mobile transport refrigeration mentioned. Any other regulation, if somebody knows it, uh, knows any differently, please let me know. But I have not seen mobile refrigeration mentioned anywhere else except here in Canada, where they're specifically talking about a limit of 2200. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Section 608. Section 608 is another, um, uh, you know, the EPA made a proposal uh, recently to uh, uh, upgrade all of the leak uh, requirements and uh, reporting requirements and training requirements and such. So I know you would have uh, come across that already. Again, that is not a final rule yet. So if you're making a list of things to watch, I would put that on my list of things to watch, especially if you're a contractor or if you have people that are working on all kinds of equipment uh, that, that, uh, that handle refrigerants. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, alternatives. We're talking about all these different kinds of uh, delisting and listing, by the way, is also going to happen. Uh, there are some new refrigerants that are going to list it very soon. And some of those refrigerants uh, are, are actually on this chart. Many of you have seen this chart. Y-axis is pressure or capacity. X-axis is GWP. This is not to scale. It's a very qualitative chart. Green means it is A1 non-flammable. Red means it is highly flammable propane, and you can see where that is on this chart. Uh, it's the only red dot. And then, of course, um, um, the, the, the pink color or purple color is actually a mixture of some of these refrigerants. And those are the new lower GWP refrigerants that are being uh, proposed by a lot of the chemical manufacturers. And those are in a whole new category to themselves called mildly flammable. The regulations are not there yet for these mildly flammable refrigerants, but some of them are already beginning to see use even in this country, okay? And they're doing it under a different, more stringent set of regulations and codes. If you look, uh, you all can spot where 404 is. It's about medium pressure. It's on the far right, uh, about 4,000 GWP. To the left of 404A, you'll see 407A, 407F, and 452A, which is a refrigerant that uh, uh, Chemors has been promoting in transport refrigeration, and it's actually beginning to uh, see some use in Europe in particular. Uh, I don't know to what extent it'll catch on uh, in new equipment, but certainly it's a good drop-in for transport refrigeration in existing 404A systems. And then to the left of that, you'll see that less than 1,500, 448, 449, and 449A and B, those are new refrigerants that are under 1,500 GWP. Many of them are already uh, EPA approved. They're on the SNAP list for supermarkets and so on. And many, uh, many component and equipment manufacturers are already looking at those refrigerants uh, for, for use in these applications. All the way to the top left, you can see CO2, very high pressure, one GWP. And of course, you heard a lot about CO2, transcritical, subcritical, and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm not going to say anything more about it. And down at the bottom, you'll notice that uh, in the pink uh, um, uh, section there, it says 12, 1234YF and ZE. That is another group of refrigerants to watch because YF is a refrigerant that's going to be used in automobile air conditioning. And uh, it is, uh, from a performance point of view, it is like 134A, but it is mildly flammable. So it requires a different set of uh, uh, handling and uh, uh, design of systems and so on. Of course, any of those refrigerants that you see there along that, X, uh, along that horizontal line extending from YF all the way up to 134A, they're all 134A-like performance refrigerants. So 134A is at about 1,400 GWP. The next group of refrigerants is 513 and 450A. Emerson already has products that are released for 450 and 513, and that's about 600 GWP. Same performance as 134A, half the GWP, 
And then the new one is our 515A, we just got announced uh, by uh, Honeywell, that is around 450 GWP. So you're gonna see a lot of this, it's 450 and it is, and it is uh, non-flammable, A1, so which is interesting. So it's even slightly better than 513 and 450 in terms of its uh, GWP number. However, it has got slightly lower capacity. So you always have to pay something for something, right? And then of course, YF is there um, that I've already talked about. This is then the, uh, the family of refrigerants. I, I have not talked about air conditioning, but if you look at 410A, the next refrigerant to replace 410A is somewhere in that category of R32 or the 447B or the 452B. That is still being debated, um, especially in those rooftop chillers that I mentioned earlier that the EPA is talking about taking out uh, 410A. One of these candidates is probably what's gonna find its way there as a replacement for it, especially in chillers. You know, with A2L, uh, it, it can be handled. There is another group of refrigerants that is uh, in that box that is labeled less than 150. Uh, 150 is sort of a, a line that a lot of people seem to be following, uh, especially it started out in Europe. It started out in Europe in automotive uh, uh, application. But that line seems to be a line that everybody wants to go at. And so you've got a couple of candidates, 455 and DR3, as well as the ARM20A. I think it's, it's, it's worth your while to keep an eye on those three refrigerants. They're not here yet, but with time over the course of the next five years, I think you're gonna see that as well. You know, for someone like me that sees this chart practically every day, I know it's easy for me to uh, peg all these different candidates and, and talk to them, but I know those of you that are seeing this chart for the first time, it probably looks like a, a, a nightmarish chart, but it's not that bad. So if I can talk to it, it is not that hard, okay? All right, um, with that, I am going to uh, pass this uh, baton to uh, Michael Britt and uh, let him take it from there. From there. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of uh, some of the company's perspectives and some of the trends and some of the things that may be driving um, changes in regulation and, and pricing um, uh, coming down the road. Uh, understanding some of those trends I think will, think will be helpful. Again, I really appreciate the opportunity to join uh, Emerson 360 today. Uh, and uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but uh, uh, we, we do work together with uh, Emerson in the Climate Technologies Group, uh, so the group you're there with, Southern Company, Emerson, the Oak Ridge National Labs, and the Pacific West uh, National Labs are working on a, a unification of small and medium-sized commercial loads. So a lot of the things that matter to you, uh, we're working every day uh, jointly with Emerson on some important work, including my good friend John, John uh, Wallace, who's there. Uh, so uh, what, we, what we thought we'd do is um, maybe share a bit about um, the energy uh, energy trends, particularly usage. So a little bit hard to see, perhaps in the room, but uh, total energy consumption. If you look at those two lines, there's a blue line and a green line. The green line is electricity, and the blue line is natural gas. And you'll see a dip during the during the economic downturn, and then really a change in slope of those that curve. Uh, electricity was fairly reliably uh, increasing in terms of consumption on an ongoing basis, and that was particularly too, true in the commercial markets. If you look down uh, at the bottom of that screen, you'll see the commercial usage as well. And there's a similar dip and then a flattening of the load curve. So while there's an increase in um, in demand today and out out the future. Uh, it's much more um, compressed. There's probably a one percent annual combined uh, compound annual growth rate of consumption in the commercial space. On top of that, the energy markets have become much more productive during that period of time. So the the chart out to the right there shows that. We're continuing to get about two percent more efficient every year in delivering uh, in delivering energy. Um, so, in terms of the linkage to GDP, we're able to produce more as an economy with the same amount of energy. So, uh, continuing to 
become more and more energy efficient with all those uh, uh, new technologies that are coming along. Let's talk a bit about commercial use for customer. You look at the blue line and the green line, what you'll notice is the green line slope really flattened very significantly. So use per customer has flattened. So what's happening is there's, there's the commercial markets are coming back, there's a bit of growth, but use per customer is flat in terms of electricity. What is growing is natural gas. Very low natural gas prices have really uh, replaced electricity growth with natural gas growth. Um, so use of, of natural gas in some applications uh, has begun to uh, begun to grow. Southern companies in the middle of a merger where we're uh, it's pending still, but we're acquiring the largest gas distribution company in America, a company called ATL Resources. Um, so this trend has not been lost on on us. So I want to share a bit about the impact on demand and particularly regulation. So if you think about all the things that are going on, um, we, we mentioned low gas prices, things like that. There's been a big move to natural gas as a form of generation of electricity. And uh, uh, things like feedstocks or chemical industries that might have been moved overseas. So there's increasing demand for natural gas, uh, particularly as coal is phased phased out as a generation source. Uh, we're, we're really committed to trying to find real solutions to environmental issues and things that make economic and technological sense. There's enormous technological change underway, and so our, our mission is to work together with companies like Emerson to find the best solutions for, for you. And uh, that's really our approach to meeting these needs, the customers that, that we are privileged to serve and our partners like Emerson uh, to address environmental uh, issues. I do want to share a bit about um, the focus on climate change. We really, if you think about what what could happen, our expectation is that uh, as coal is phased out, natural gas will become the next focus for uh, elimination of, of carbon, decarbonization of the economy. So. Uh, the role of natural gas over the long run will really be to bridge us to some new technologies. We're not sure quite what they will be. Those are things we're working on today to try to to try to identify. Um, but we do anticipate that there'll be increasing energy costs in the future as more environmental regulations come come along, and those will affect our customers, those of you in the room. Uh, as well as uh, as our our cost of operations, which then show up in uh, in electric rates. Um, so let's talk a bit about regulation and the impact by market, because it's really different. There are two there are two different markets. So some of you are served in markets that have an RTO, that's a regional transmission operator, or an ISO, an independent system operator. Um, those are disaggregated markets where generators bid into a market and distribution companies are your provider, but they're buying uh, a wholesale power. Those kinds of markets create opportunities and, and uh, threats. So uh, th there's some trade-offs. We'll focus on each of those. But really, uh, a bid market is every market participant is kind of equal and FERC Federal Energy Regulatory Commission really manages and controls those markets. Vertically integrated markets, those are the ones that focus most on the customer and balancing the needs of all the participants are state control. Uh, and the value proposition can be different because if you're bidding into the market, if, if you have demand side management and uh, capability uh, and they get into unified loads, you may be able to bid into the markets that serve you and begin to be a player in the market. Uh, that means you take the risk of the market, both the upside and the downside. Um, on the state control side, vertically integrated markets really give you greater input into the structuring of programs, energy efficiency demand side programs, and give you a little bit more protection. It tends to smooth out uh, the market impacts. The market risks are, are managed by the utility that provides those services subject to state regulators. Uh, so it's a little different uh, environment. 
couple markets to really watch. Our industry is a, re a real inflection point. You think about the electric industry. New York State has spoke as uh, something called New York Rev, and it's essentially turning the distribution system, which has traditionally been viewed as a uh, a natural monopoly, into something that is an independent market. So instead of just the New York ISO operating the transmission system, they'll now be an independent operator of the distribution system. So the wires and managing the local wires in your community uh, as a market, as an independent market. There'll be a lot of changes coming in terms of services, in terms of opportunities to participate in that, and frankly, potentially some risks as customers uh, served by that. So you'll need to really understand what's going on in New York uh, if, you're, if you operate there. Also, you want to keep an eye on it because it could be that some of the aspects of New York Rev become a part of the regulatory construct in the states that you operate in. So make sure you understand what the implications are of, of a distribution system operator. California, similar to New York Rev, is trying to look at this only as a series of commission dockets. Instead of one big effort, uh, California has a series of commission dockets uh, that are all, all underway, focused on different aspects of uh, re-regulating re the power industry in California. California is always a little bit different. Uh, and and uh, so, but again, pay attention to California and New York. We actually think Illinois is also an interesting market. Uh, <clears throat> if you think about what's happening there, the state has made some efforts to in, to promote utility investment in infrastructure like microgrids and creating real uh, flexibility in the distribution system, which may create opportunities for you, again, to participate in new ways in those markets. Uh, that's really uh, it in terms of uh, my, my uh, comments. I look forward to, to questions, but at this point, I'll pass over to uh, Mark. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's great to be with everyone today. I appreciate Emerson inviting me to uh, present on the Food Safety Modernization Act, and we love our acronyms, so we're going to refer to it as FISMA. You may hear it referred to as FSMA. And really the goal today is to provide a very high-level review about this law, tons of components, and it impacts a whole swath of industry that wasn't impacted before but do a real high level and then focus a little bit on where we're gonna see an impact for retailers, grocery and convenience stores. So, you know, the first thing that I like to emphasize, in particular with my students, is that this is the first change to our food safety network since 1938. We had a food safety law in 1906. It worked okay for a while and we updated it in 1938. And then we left it. And to give some context, you know, for what 1938 would look like, a frame of reference, you could get an all-you-can-eat ice cream buffet, um, all-you-can-eat ice cream buffet in 1938 for 10 cents. Uh, I don't even know if that's available anymore or if it would be uh, 10 cents. So it, that gives a frame of reference in time, and it also gives a frame of reference of how much we're trying to do in this period of time. We're, we're updating the food safety system for the first time in 75 years. As it pertains to the FDA, we're not impacting USDA, so we're not impacting meat, poultry, just the FDA side. But we're doing 75 years worth of lifting at once. And so it's a pretty big change, and that's really why I like to emphasize the amount of time that it's taken for this law to come into effect, and also why it's taken so long for the law to be finalized. It was passed in 2011 and signed into law in 2011, and just now in 2016, we're finalizing what that law looks like in terms of the regulations and putting those into effect in 2017. So the initial question is, how does FISMA function? And we have a technical answer and we have a practical answer. And the technical answer is very easy. FISMA gave FDA new authorities, and we'll talk about those in a couple of slides, and it created seven substantive core rules that basically gave regulation to places that didn't have it before and new regulation for places that did have it. But more practically, what FISMA did was to, through this amendment, push the burden of compliance from the FDA to industry. And we've seen this before, if you're familiar with the generally recognized the safe concept, GROSS, uh, used to be that you had to ap uh, apply to the FDA every time you wanted to affirm a substance was GROSS. 
uh, food contact substances, doing notifications, and then moving to self-affirmations. Same thing here, the FDA is saying, you know your supply chain best, you make sure that up and down the supply chain, you're verifying compliance with the law. And you, you see that every day, you see it on a weekly, monthly basis, you have the economic incentive to do it, we're gonna put it on you. And what that practically means is, number one, that we're really integrating the supply chain from the supplier all the way to the grocery store level. That entire supply chain is integrated. And we're creating new liability traps to put incentive for self-regulation. So you want to make sure that your supplier is in compliance because otherwise you fail to either meet a documentation requirement or a duty requirement, which opens yourself to legal liability, both from the regulators as well as from private industry. Um, from private plaintiffs, which we see a lot of with the labeling litigation, we're going to see, I think, a lot more of that as FSMA, as FSMA comes on board. So as I mentioned, you know, FSMA at its core is constituted of seven rules. Each of these rules is about 600 pages, and accompanying that is about 800 pages of analysis and economic impact and different things. No way I can get into all of the ins and outs of what each of these rules is going to be, but I want to just give a highlight of what some of these rules are gonna do. And you're gonna hear in this, you know, an emphasis that some of this is for the first time. So produce safety, for the first time we're regulating how farmers produce the produce and um, agricultural items that end up in our food and end up in raw agricultural commodities. So we've never had the farm regulated before. The animal preventative controls rule, for the first time we're regulating the good manufacturing practices of animal feed and food. Sanitary transportation, we're regulating for the first time how food makes it from the manufacturer to the grocery store. And in, in that, we're raising questions about, is it temperature sensitive? And how do we maintain that temperature during transport? Human preventative controls. We've all heard of the uh, hazard analysis and critical control point HACCP model. We're bringing HACCP in as a requirement pretty much across industry. We've modified it. It's not exactly HACCP, but it's gonna be like that. The foreign supplier verification program, we're now requiring even our foreign suppliers to be compliant with this new rule, putting that burden again on the importer. So it's shifting that paradigm where we used to rely on the cheapest price or who could source it the best, and now it's gonna change. And that liability trap, we're gonna want someone that's the most compliant. Third-party verification, if you're a third party coming in to verify compliance with good manufacturing practices, you need to be certified by the FDA. And an intentional adulteration rule where we're addressing terrorism concerns, addressing some concerns about um, employee uh, misconduct where we can have intentional adulteration. I also mentioned that the FDA is getting some new powers under FSMA, and this is a really important part of FSMA, is for the first time the FDA has given some teeth. Prior to this, the FDA could ask, they could request, they could really plead for you to do something as a facility, and you had the option of saying yes or no, depending on what your risk profile was. And if you said no, the FDA had to go to court pretty much for everything that it wanted to compel you to do even if there was a really big health crisis that required you to pull that food off the market, the FDA would have to go to court to actually mandate that you do that. That's changing. We now have mandatory recalls. The FDA can compel you, force you to conduct a recall. They're gonna ask you first and give you a grace period to comply, and we, that's why we haven't seen this used yet, but then you will have to issue the recall and you will have to do that. We see the threshold for administrative detentions and uh, seizures dramatically lowered it used to be that the FDA needed credible evidence to seize food, uh, credible evidence of adulteration, credible evidence of misbranding. And now the FDA just has to have a reason to believe that it's adulterated or misbranded. A much easier threshold where if they're seeing that there's noncompliance with a particular rule, that could give them a reasonable belief to put that food on hold. And then we're seeing the ability to suspend food facility registrations. There's a group of facilities that have to register with the FDA as a food establishment. And once you have that establishment, that's basically your license to be selling food in the U.S. And what the FDA now has the ability to do is to revoke that license. And you, as the party that's been revoked, have to go to court. Rather than the FDA going to court, you have to go to court to prove that you're able to get your license back. And with each of these authorities, we've seen the FDA either threaten to use them or use them pretty immediately as soon as they have them. And these are in effect, whereas with the rules, the rules are just now coming into effect in 2017. So when we look at what we're doing in FSMA, we're really regulating the full food chain. We're going from base ingredients, either if they're foreign or domestic, we're going from the farm, we're going all the way through that production cycle to 
the grocery store, convenience store, wherever that consumer is going to find that end product. And for the FDA, that end part of the chain, the grocery store, the convenience store, the retail outlet, is now part of the regulation, and it's really seen as a key component where we are able to communicate with consumers and connect consumers to the products they purchase, to the suppliers and manufacturers that they're purchasing from. And this is really important, and we're seeing this now with the CRF frozen food recall. We've seen it with others like the Bluebell ice cream recall. How do we effectively communicate to consumers that they may have in their fridge or freezer a product that has listeria, has salmonella, has glass or chemical contamination, that needs to be returned to the store, returned to the manufacturer, and not consumed. And what FISMA initially said, and it's still part of the statute, is that the FDA was to establish for grocery stores and convenience stores that have 15 or more locations a manner and location for recall notices. And it was supposed to be this conspicuous place where you put it. And an example of what this may have looked like would have been in the Bluebell recall maybe putting recall notices over the ice cream section or putting them near the frozen uh, frozen cases. The FDA has stalled on that in part because they're not really sure where that conspicuous location is, where that conspicuous manner is. How do we communicate to consumers in our stores that they have a recalled product? Something the FDA is still figuring out. And what we see at the moment is that the FDA is relying on the new database that's required, the reportable food database, where you have to put notices up so that uh, retail outlets can find out about them. Public release, press releases that we have has always been a part of a recall, and that hasn't changed. And what we're seeing is industry groups now pushing for FDA to finalize some regulation, some guidance around what grocery stores and convenience stores need to do to help in that FSMA recall obligation. And this ultimately is the biggest impact for the grocery stores, um, convenience stores, and other retail outlets is figuring out exactly how to participate in this recall requirement, how that's going to look, as well as understanding that access to products is going to be really changing as suppliers and manufacturers start to comply with this. It won't be as much of a change for larger manufacturers. They're catching up more quickly, but for the smaller uh, mid-sized manufacturers, it's really going to be an issue. And for some areas of industry, it's going to be a big concern, like transportation and different areas like that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dean for questions. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Rajan and Michael, for informative presentations. Uh, we will be taking questions from our web-connected audience. If you're on the web, you can use the chat feature to submit questions uh, to us here. Uh, we will take those questions and read them back to our presenters. Uh, to get that started, Mark, I'd like to start with you. Um, with your broad insight into the FDA, how would you describe the agency's readiness and its enthusiasm for this broad new responsibility? One of the interesting things about FSMA is, is an education for everyone, education for industry, education for the FDA. They, for the first time, are doing all of this as well. They're learning as we are learning. So what the FDA has expressed is in these areas with the substantive rules, there's a keenness to cooperate, to educate, and to really be proactive. What we've also seen is an eagerness and a readiness to use any of the new power that they have to come out. So the FDA seems very ready, very proactive, and um, willing to work with industry, but also willing to implement its new authority. A, remind, a reminder to people here in the room, if you do have a question, you can write it down, pass it to the aisle, and we'll run it up to the front of, the front of the room as well. Michael, question for you. Um, what has been the process by which federal regulators have evaluated and then adopted the state regulations that you mentioned, the types of regulations that were emerging in some of these other markets? Great question. Um, really, when you start with all this, there are two fundamental underlying uh, rules that drive all of this, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And so all of these regulatory changes are really going to be hinging off of or leveraging off of an interpretation of that legislation. But remember the old uh, uh, after-school special, how do you make a bill kind of song? Well, it goes through, Congress writes uh, some legislation, the bill 
gets the present, he will sign it. Then it, what happens, that's when it starts to get interesting because the EPA will create a rule, a proposed rule. There'll be a rulemaking, and uh, that will allow comment and people to get engaged and involved in what uh, what those rules might be and how those legis how that legislation can be interpreted. So there are a lot of opportunities to begin to engage uh, uh, throughout that process, either with legislators or uh, EPA and uh, industry associations are a good avenue to do some of that. But then once the once the regulation is finalized, it's uh, codified in a um, in a CFR code of federal regulations. But that's when the fun begins because now the rule is really tested. Then usually with litigation almost right away. So the courts end up deciding a lot of what regulation means and whether the intent of the legislation is met, those sorts of things. So often it's a very lengthy process, lots of sausage making. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Raja, next question is for you. Uh, could you comment on the state of building code standards, both nationally and locally, for A3 flammables and A2L mildly flammables? That's a two hour long answer, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, in short, uh, a lot of the safety standards are being worked on right now, uh, not just U.S. When I say U.S., we're talking about U.L. standards, um, but also uh, internationally, IEC as well as the ISO standards, and ASHRAE, ASHRAE 15.1, 15.2. They're all being worked on right now. Uh, groups of people, volunteers, are working very hard to get it all done by 2017. The goal is if they finish it all by 2017, then we can get into this cycle of 2018 to 2021 to get all the building codes done. Alongside of that, there is an effort to see if there is a way to try and shorten that building code cycle instead of waiting till 2021 to have all these A2L and updated A3 regulations in place. Can we somehow do something sooner than that? I don't know how, um, how successful that effort will be, but there are A3 um, refrigerants that are allowed today and uh, the charge limits are small but they are allowed and the same thing is true for A2. A2 regulations already exist in safety standards and they already exist in building codes. The A2L refrigerants that I talked about earlier, some of the OEMs especially in air conditioning are trying to get out some products that are A2L but using the A2 regulations. So you'll see some of those things uh, beginning to happen. Thank you, Rajan. Uh, Mark, we have a couple of questions from here in the, uh, in the live audience that I'll direct to you first. Um, since we went 80 years without changing food safety laws, what do you think are the key problems that must be fixed now? Which ones are going to get the most attention immediately from the FDA? This is where, in part, I have. Uh, this is in part where I have an answer and a criticism. Uh, legislation and the law is slow, so it's reacting. And what it's reacting to is we had the melanin scare, we had the spinach recall, we had a number of really big recalls that were either due to uh, micro contamination pathogens that were on our food, or they were due to uh, adding an additive that shouldn't have been in our food. So we reacted to that, and we finally said okay, enough is enough, we've had too many recalls, we've had too many issues, we're gonna go ahead and move forward with just uh, this type of legislation. But then at the same time, we have this idea of food additives being in our food that we may not know about. And so we have this dual idea where we wanna be sure that we're complying with the pathogen idea that's reactive, but consumers are really concerned about what's in my food, and so we have to balance that. It's not quite the regulation yet, but that is really the consumer concern is what food additives are being used in my food. We saw this with the big pink slime issue. It was in meat. Uh, consumers were very unaware that that was a food additive. It wasn't on the label. And that was really harmful to that company. So it's two things. It's being reactive to what the law was with pathogens and contamination, but being sensitive to what consumers are currently wanting, knowing real clarity what's in their food. A follow-up question to that uh, from some of the retailers that are here with us in the room. What retailers do you see taking a leading response to FISMA? Who, who's the most active in the retail grocery convenience store area? You no, know, we actually haven't seen a lot 
uh, at this time because there really hasn't been too much other than the recall requirement for the grocery. There has been some interest to make sure that the supply chain remains able to meet their demands, and we're seeing some interest in that regard. Uh, but there hasn't been a proactive push yet for this recall thing uh, to happen. There has been some collaboration and some feedback with the FDA to help do that. And there has been some trade groups that are doing that, but it's been um, fairly quiet and more industry, more consumer-based industry groups that are asking for this recall element to come into place. Thank you, Mark. Uh, question from Michael. Uh, what are the current primary drivers of new regulation in the energy space and how can retail businesses have more early input into some of those emerging regulations? Well, I think they're two primary drivers for the uh, new energy regulations. Um, one is rapid change in technology. If you think about uh, the price curves for renewable energy, if you think about the uh, technology advancements in communications and distributed generation, uh, it's providing a lot of options for uh, for customers in the market to, to explore. Uh, and uh, so regulation is really trying to play a bit of catch up, catch up on, on innovation and technology. Uh, another piece of what's happening that's driving change in regulation. So you see that in New York Rev, you see that in California, uh, and you see Illinois trying to promote that kind of investment. Um, where uh, the other the other big driver, of course, is is environmental uh, and climate, and uh, we're focusing on uh, cleaner sources of power. So the Clean Power Plan, for instance, which is uh, uh, has been uh, uh, sent back to the uh, uh, district court for uh, it's been remanded there. Uh, expect it will probably come back to the. Uh, Supreme Court, and it will probably be a divided 4-4 vote, in which case the district court's ruling will prevail. Uh, don't know what will happen there, but if that were to happen, depends on the timeline of how quickly um, the D.C. Circuit uh, works through uh, the, the remand issues from the Supreme Court. So we really see uh, environmental things like the refrigerants that you were talking about, uh, you know, and, and clean power plants, things like that are really driven by the environmental, uh, uh, the need to en enhance and, and, and uh, uh, create greater controls around environmental. So things like energy management systems and, and uh, things like that will become more and more important. Uh, Self-generation may be a piece of something that uh, customers are going to begin to look at more, more uh, seriously. Thanks, Michael. The next question is for Rajan. Uh, will the limit of 150 grams of flammable refrigerants be increased? And if so, when do you think that will happen? <laughs> Don't know the answer to the question. Um, I think um, by 2017, the end of 2017, which is when the safety centers will get completed, uh, there is effort to increase it to 300 grams. Uh, some people are talking about 500 grams. Uh, there is even discussion about kilogram levels of charge uh, from uh, some of the folks in, in, the, in, in the European market. Uh, but uh, even if that happens globally, uh, it will probably get adopted in the U.S. under our safety requirements and guidelines. So what happens on the IEC or ISI, especially the IEC standard, will not necessarily translate one for one here in the U.S. because when, the, when UL adopts that number, they will, uh, they will adjust it for the local uh, market needs and safety requirements and so on. So the answer is I don't know, but it could be within a year to a year and a half. Well, while you're predicting, um, what do you think about the EPA SNAP approval for A2Ls? Um, the EPA actually has uh, SNAP approved R32 in small charge systems, window air conditioners and PTAC and PTHPs. They've already done that. Uh, that is, so that in terms of A2Ls being SNAP approved by uh, the EPA, that has already begun. They've already SNAP approved 1234YF for um, 
automotive application, automotive AC, and then Z for foams and so on. So the A2L approval by the EPA has already begun. If you're talking about A2L approval for refrigeration needs, um, I think uh, within a year you're going to start seeing some A2Ls being approved, especially for self-contained equipment and such. So I'd, I'd watch uh, the EPA website, if nothing else, at least once a week. Thanks, Rajan. A reminder to those of you who are connected by the web, you can submit questions using the chat feature on WebEx. Just type your question in, send it to uh, the location here, and uh, we'll get it uh, to the front of the room and get it asked to our panelists. Mark, another question for you. Uh, what do you think will be the largest impact to grocery operators and when due to the new FDA rules and the role of the FDA in regulation? This is a good question. I think one of the biggest impacts will be disruption in supply. And what we're seeing, you know, is an integration of the supply chain and more responsibility for that and more reasons both for recall or to slow production. And I think we're going to have a period of time for at least the first year to three years that FISMA is in effect where it's going to be disruptions due to recalls, disruptions due to suppliers not be able to find compliant supply. And that's already been an issue where we're just talking about with clients um, what suppliers to use. And they have suppliers that are either foreign that don't want to participate in FISMA or who are domestic and don't feel that that interpretation of FISMA is correct or they want to challenge FISMA in some way. And so it's kind of coming to this question, well, where do I get the supply for my product? So we are kind of inspecting some rough transition period there. Um, and, you know, looking at the supply integration issue, we're looking at the frozen food recall, 340 products over 42 brands. That's going to be kind of a common recall that's going to happen under FISMA. We're going to see bigger recalls, re recalls from one company triggering and rippling throughout. And so that can be a real disruption as well. Follow-up question to that, Mark. You mentioned earlier in the presentation the, uh, the temperature tracking that is required. Uh, how has that changed and what impact do you think that will have on grocery retailers, convenience stores, and uh, restaurant, the restaurant business? So what we're seeing in particular for temperature control outside of the manufacturing process is there's a need for uh, carriers to identify whether or not temperature is a potential hazard for adulteration, uh, in particular for spoilage. So for pasteurized products, we're we're treating the pathogens through pasteurization, through thermal or acidification. But for other foods that are temperature sensitive, maybe ready to eat foods that are going to go from a frozen food manufacturer to a frozen truck, refrigerated truck, onto a grocery shelf, we want to make sure the temperature stays consistent. And what we're seeing in the transportation rule is a need for carriers to be educated on temperature, uh, carriers to be able to monitor temperature, and carriers to be able to verify and calibrate the uh, refrigeration equipment that they're using in their trucks. And that's the real key that's real been new is the carriers have never had that responsibility, have never had that obligation. And what they're having to do now is train on both ends, receiving and dropping off at the retailer to make sure that at both ends they're maintaining temperature throughout the process. So Mark, one more follow up on that. When that food comes all the way through the chain and from the transporter to the retailer, uh, what what obligation is there for record keeping for that record keeping the transfer or is that clear at this point? So what the FDA has established is a system called good transportation practices. We've seen uh, an, an analogy of this is good manufacturing practices for the manufacturing process. What the FDA is saying with good, trans good transportation practices is a key is documentation. So you need to document that your employees are trained for the uh, both loading and unloading on both sides that they're aware of food safety risks and that you're documenting how frequently you're calibrating the equipment, when you're loading, what temperature you're loading at, and so forth. So there's gonna be documentation throughout the entire process. And one of the key features of FISMA is documentation and it's heavy in each rule. Thank you, Thank Mark. You. Uh, question for Rajan. <laughs> Rajan, how do you describe the state of contractor readiness uh, for flammables and other alternate refrigerants? Not very good, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, even in Europe, where um, they've got much more experience with flammable refrigerants, 
uh, not all the contractors can handle and know how to handle flammables. And I think uh, in, in our country, it's uh, probably a whole lot worse. Uh, more so than that, I think is gonna be the burden on contractors and uh, service people to carry all these multiple refrigerants and being able to, you know, if one is A1 um, and another one is A3, uh, do they, and they gotta handle them and use them and store them differently. How do you do all that? How do you do all that in one facility? How do you do all that on one truck? And how do you do all that through one person? Uh, do you have one person just handling A3s and do you have another person handling all the A1s because you know, can you switch your brain from one to the other? I don't know. Those are all the challenges that I think we as an industry are gonna face. It's not gonna be easy to do all these things. Thanks, Rajan. Our last question for Mark Sanchez. Uh, does the FDA see more or new risk to the food supply when they're delivered by online grocers? No, I don't know that the FDA has analyzed uh, these new services where groceries are being delivered. Uh, what they have said is that if there's a grocery delivery service, they're gonna rely on state regulation, county regulation to make sure that those are certified parties. I think they're gonna be treated more as a restaurant or an extension of a restaurant where they're gonna to need to have a health certificate and have a uh, health inspector type review. Uh, the FDA has said really their focus on the transportation rule is to focus on the carrier's interstate conveyance of them of the food. Uh, so I don't know if the FDA has addressed that particularly yet. And I think as time goes on, what we see with these new technologies and these new services is as they're matured on the market and they present new risks, that's when the FDA will find and decide whether or not it's time to regulate. It's a very reactive process to regulate and to legislate. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for participating today. Michael Britt from Southern Companies and our neighbor at Technology Square for our new Helix Innovation Center at Georgia Tech. Thank you as well. Dr. Rajan Rajendran here in the, in the room, thank you as well. Uh, for all of you who are both in the room and online, uh, we will be posting this r webcast for replay. Uh, if you did sign up, you will get an email notifying you of when it will be available uh, for that replay and the web address. Uh, thanks again for joining us at uh, Emerson Climate Technologies and Retail Solutions, and uh, we wish you a good day.